Hi there, welcome back to the Daniel Rosal podcast. This is episode number 33 of the podcast. Now, I want to just say a couple of notes. Firstly, I did start this podcast a couple of years back and um, it was at the time something I intended getting into and it's just kind of fallen off my uh, creative radar since. My creative, uh, so it's not very active is what I'm trying to say, uh, given the fact that frequently six months uh, elapse, elapses between episodes, people probably got that idea. But just saying that for anybody who is subscribed to this podcast, my I am one person and uh, have limited time, but I do love creating content. It's kind of what sort of keeps me going and keeps my creative juices going. Most of my work currently, um, I'm putting a lot of effort into my YouTube channel because I think video is super cool and very exciting and gives me a lot of scope for learning because it's uh, something that's more new to me than writing and audio. So I'm doing a lot of work there. So you can look me up, uh, anyone interested in this podcast on YouTube, just type Daniel Rosal for lack of a more imaginative name for a channel or rather until I figure out a uh, more specific niche I'm just calling it by my name, uh, so there. That's why you. That's where you can find me on YouTube, and you can also check out my Medium blog. It is DanielRosal.Medium.com. Um, again, very unimaginative, and that's where I'm doing a lot of writing. I also have a personal blog uh, because I've been hosting my own websites for so long, for literally like ten years at this point, that I have a like mixed feeling about Medium. It makes it so easy to publish, but equally, I feel like I should be doing the responsible thing and publishing on my own. Uh, web infrastructure so that is danielsrosal.com so that's my bargaining online empire or some kind of current uh, current components to it that I'm publishing my stuff so speaking of medium I put a uh, blog up there today and it's called uh, three keys to creating a more effective remote working environment now I'm going to be putting this podcast episode up onto this uh, aforementioned YouTube uh, channel so um, I'll put a link in that description I'll also put a link in the description of this actual podcast episode. And I wrote this this morning uh, because I do think, I do feel very passionately about this subject. I'm a huge believer in remote work. I think it can revolutionize um, the game for people based in Israel specifically. That's my kind of selfish uh, aspect to it, is that being based here and being an English speaker, I've sometimes been frustrated by the local uh, job market. Not that there isn't a job market in Israel, as most people know, there is a very big uh, technology scene here, but sometimes it has its frustrating aspects. And um, I think this idea of being able to work with the world is uh, brilliant. And I've been advocating for many years. I've been freelancing for full-time for about three years and four months and probably coming up on three and a half years but I've been doing it also as a side hustle so I've been freelancing from Israel for about seven years at this point and I've always been advocating that if you're going to have a teak which means in Hebrew a file and uh, you have the ability to work with English-speaking clients you should work with clients anywhere in the world if you're going to be going to the hassle of working for yourself uh, you may as well expand your horizons beyond Israel and uh, as I've mentioned, everything regarding Israel in the world seems to be polarizing. And people say, oh, but you have to work with Israeli companies and uh, blah, blah, blah. And I don't see it like that at all. In fact, I see it as um, almost 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 a uh, almost a patriotic thing to work with the world, because you're going to the more Israeli based people or Israel based people work internationally, the more accustomed uh, foreign companies are going to be to working with people in Israel. It's going to stop sounding like this random place in the desert and uh, more like you know oh yeah we've got some guys in Israel so I'm a big advocate big fan for it and um, I've been over the course of the past couple of years involved in uh, a variety of team and configurations ranging from freelancing on contracts with companies to working as a hybrid worker with Israeli companies which means you show up to the office one day or two days per week and uh, fully remote now has to be said I have had a tumultuous experience with the um, hybrid uh, work environment in particular in fact over the past couple of years I have exited uh, myself from not just one but two hybrid relationships that frankly did not work out and this was kind of the impetus for writing this post it was um, I've seen really good work environments and I've seen really poorly done remote working environments and therefore I've just drawn a few conclusions because I think that this is going to be the way everything will be going and of course it would be better to have good than bad uh, work environments so here's my list here are the three things I believe are uh, are key to 
creating better remote work environments. Number one is uh, the management style uh, that is going on. And this is the biggest criticism I'd have of the two short, my two short lived tenures with Israeli companies in a hybrid configuration was that they were super micromanagerial. And I find that I, I personally, as a creative, find that just incredibly frustrating. In fact, it's one of the first things when I'm going for a job interview that I try to suss out is how does, what kind of job is this? Is this kind of a job where you're looking for someone to contribute ideas, to, uh, you know, to, to create a strategy, or are you looking for someone just to execute? And the danger is that people will mislead you, which has happened to me on a number of occasions. But if people are being honest, even a couple of answers to that question can be enormously telling. And this is the weird, this is the thing that I think sometimes has thrown me for a loop is you have these companies, I, wor I work mostly with the technology sector because uh, that's just my experience, it's my interest and it's a big part of the market here. And you all, you'll often have these very uh, technologically advanced companies, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're developing an API or they're uh, developing a mainframe to cloud backup platform or something techy. And because they're techy, you kind of think, well, they must be super modern in all respects. And I frequently find that that's not the case. Now, I regard autocratic top-down management as an outdated idea. I don't really see it as congruous with being a modern organization, but that's um, I've encountered that very frequently among companies and surprisingly in Israel, because Israel has kind of reputation as a, I'm trying to just uh, not make this just about my experience here in Israel, but Israel has a reputation as a very informal culture uh, but I have quite frequently encountered strangely hierarchical organizations here, which I personally attribute to uh, the military background of a lot of people, uh, especially startup founders, that I imagine a military functions in a very autocratic manner. Um, but I don't think that works well in remote environments. I think if you're going to be hiring uh, for remote, you're going to be hiring remote workers, you need to give them, your remote workers, a bit of breathing space. And uh, if you are micromanaging your remote workers and to just kind of give a couple of salient examples of micromanagement if you're checking in with them five times per day how are your task lists going there's a 9 a.m check and there's a 12 p.m check and there's a 2 p.m check in and there's a 4 p.m check and i would class that as probably micromanagement um i would also i uh, classify you know when your boss asks you to ask to be cc'd on every single email that's another classic micromanager move so if that's the case i would say why are you hiring remote workers in the first place because if you don't trust your workers to have some degree of uh, freedom and uh, trust their input then what's the point of doing remote working just for the sake of remote working it's fine to say it doesn't work for you and i think that's what we're seeing at the moment is there is a big rush among startups and startups especially to say yeah we do remote work we're fully remote or we're hybrid but not everybody's actually has the internal company philosophy and managerial capability to work with that because as i said if you're going to have anxious micromanagers they're not that's not that's going to set up a horrible clash with remote workers who by and large i believe i think I think it's fair to say tend to be more self-motivated than your average employee. They're kind of more veering towards independent contributors. A lot of them might have backgrounds in self-employment and they love working somewhat independently. They're self-motivators. And if you're going to put those people directly under micromanagers, then it's a recipe for disaster. Or more honestly, it's just a recipe for turnover. But turnover is a big much much bigger waste of money than i think many companies realize because uh you know retention retention being cheaper than hiring and all, all these stats aside it's just a big waste of time to constantly being interviewing and bringing people up to speed only for them to leave and bleeding out institutional knowledge so that's all that's all a big waste of time um so the second thing actually and it's a related point is I'm a big believer in uh, documentation. Um, documenting things, standard operating procedures, SOPs, or just anything else. And I think in the remote environment, this becomes more key. Now, the type, I've frequently worked with organizations that are you know, kind of in this crazy um, scaling mode. And sometimes when scale happens too quickly, it's very discom discombobulating. You've got people joining every week and um, it's almost chaos. Now, I think one way of mitigating the chaos a little bit 
is to have some really, really solid uh, knowledge management systems in place, KMS. Now, this is something I'm pedantic about and I find it's a battle. Either I can decide that we're going to be doing this or people will say, no, that's a waste of time. Um, it's not adding value. And I think that's a short-sighted approach. I think it's a tremendous value add to be um, documenting what people know or what, pe- what, new peop- what new people particularly need to know in a company. The reason I say I think this is particularly important in the remote environment is when you have people spread across different time zones, you have people frequently uh, joining the company, then uh, you know if you're saying the same thing, I've seen this so many times, over and over again, you're having the sales guy give the same brief to new hires about how we run sales in this company, then you're wasting time because that does not need to be a repetitive one-to-one brief. That does not even need to be a synchronous meeting. And I'll talk about async versus synchronous in a second. Uh, That basically is a poor process and that process can be much improved by having that asynchronous and uh, knowledge management. So you could have, I'm a big fan of Confluence, which is part of the Atlassian suite. There's also Google Sites, there's Google Docs. It can, it can be, you can host internal, you can have an internal podcast, here's an idea. You can have an internal video library, here's another idea. And you can just have internal text. So you've actually got a bunch of different options. Um, you can even do all three. You could have videos and make those extract out MP3s and extract text from that. I've talked in the context of my marketing podcast um, about the value of, uh, you know, making information available across all different formats so you've got a a variety of options there at your disposal but uh you basically should do that internally i think that that can be a really really big uh, value add is you know this can be a job for someone you you can absolutely have a knowledge manager in the company but it's probably for smaller to medium teams not really a big enough um enterprise and it's going to be a limited job for somebody you're going to have to have someone who really really loves uh documentation so more likely an internal communications person could do this or if you just have a general comms person or a marketing communications person i personally love this and i always volunteer myself for the effort but uh anyway i think it's really important in a remote environment to always be uh always be documenting so final thing here on my list is making asynchronous communication your default and not your backup so I love async and I'm a big fan of stuff like Loom and Yak and uh, all the other tools that um, are designed for asynchronous communications. It just just to, just in case anyone has not heard about this, async basically communication between two parties or more parties that does not require everyone there at the same time, contrast with synchronous communication in which everyone does. So this is, again, if I can point to something I've seen in poor remote work organizations where there's just chaos and uh, people are not working effectively and morale is low and there's confusion and that it all goes hand in hand Um, and again I'm not trying to knock on Israel here but something I've seen I think Israelis actually really struggle with is this is a big uh, phone phone first culture in which you know the default way to resolve issues is talking now I don't think there's anything wrong with talking Uh, I just think that uh, if everyone talks in real time or just picks up the phone and calls another or picks up slack and slack voips one another which is basically just the exact same thing uh it's very hard for anyone to get into a flow work state um so async isn't about talking less it's about uh talking not in real time in other words an email it's just the most simple async communication uh channel that everyone is familiar with and uh, that's actually async is you can write someone an email and you know when they are checking their email they'll go through their emails in a batch and it's actually generally more effective now you can't in many organizations you can't only have async and the example i give in this blog post is if you call an ambulance you need someone an ambulance operator or a dispatch center you need them to be there ready to pick up a call and speak to you right now to ask you questions about where is the emergency happening etc so you can't have an ambulance service work async you can't have it that you know they check their they check their uh, voicemail once or twice a day and uh you know they get back to you and you know the, the the patient could be gone at that point so we can see that clearly um async is not cannot be absolute in many contexts but the 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 point here is that 
most businesses do not have emergency situations or people are grossly abusing the ease of synchronous communication which is ultimately a form of selfishness that you want an answer right away um to be impatient so what i what i think i don't think it should be only async i think for most companies there should be separate channels for true emergencies but those are probably uh you know revenue critical mission critical emergencies but those are probably few and far between and really limited to specific uh, teams and i think that for most uh, teams async first will actually work perfectly well and really works well in remote because of the fact that people are in different time zones and people are spread across the world uh, and therefore it, it can be a real bottleneck if everyone's just like calling one another and the guy isn't available so um, remote can actually be I think a great way for organizations to ease into um asynchronous communications as a kind of philosophy so that's about it i don't want to make this overly long those are my three recommendations based on my personal experience at working as a contractor hybrid worker uh remote worker with different companies in different countries and three things i think that if they're done well i believe can make very very positive contributions uh towards the success of an organization thank you very much for watching and as uh, for listening and as i mentioned at the start of this podcast if you want to catch up with more of my uh, content creation activity i tend to talk a lot about marketing communications i talk um i do some videos about israel i do some videos about remote working and async and uh, it's kind of free form at the moment so it's a little bit all over the place topic wise but if you do want to catch uh, my thoughts on those subjects then uh, you can check out my medium as i mentioned that's daniel rosal.com medium.com my youtube is danielrosal.com slash medium or you can go on to my uh my home page which is daniel rosal rosal has two l's in it.com and i have links up there to uh basically everywhere almost everywhere i am on the internet my youtube my medium my email address if you want to contact me danielrosal.com thank you guys for listening and have a uh, enjoy the holidays and the upcoming new year and i will speak to you all soon